This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. War of the Worlds by H. G. Wells Book One, Chapter Twelve What I Saw of the Destruction of Weybridge and Shepperton as the dawn grew brighter we withdrew from the window from which we had watched the martians and went very quietly downstairs the artilleryman agreed with me that the house was no place to stay in he proposed he said to make his way londonward and thence rejoin his battery number twelve of the horse artillery my plan was to return at once to leatherhead and so greatly had the strength of the martians impressed me that i had determined to take my wife to newhaven and go with her out of the country forthwith for i already perceived clearly that the country about london must inevitably be the scene of a disastrous struggle before such creatures as these could be destroyed between us and leatherhead however lay the third cylinder with its guarding giants had I been alone, I think I should have taken my chances and struck across country, but the artilleryman dissuaded me. "'It's no kindness to the right sort of wife,' he said, "'to make her a widow.' And in the end I agreed to go with him, under cover of the woods, northward as far as Street Cobham, before I parted with him. Thence I would make a big detour by Epsom to reach Leatherhead.' I should have started at once, but my companion had been in active service, and he knew better than that. He made me ransack the house for a flask, which he filled with whisky, and we lined every available pocket with packets of biscuits and slices of meat. Then we crept out of the house and ran as quickly as we could down the ill-made road by which I had come overnight. The houses seemed deserted. In the road lay a group of three charred bodies close together, struck dead by the heat ray and here and there were things that people had dropped a clock a slipper a silver spoon and the like poor valuables at the corner turning up towards the post office a little cart filled with boxes and furniture and horseless heeled over on a broken wheel a cash box had been hastily smashed open and thrown under the debris except the lodge at the orphanage which was still on fire none of the houses had suffered very greatly here the heat ray had shaved the chimney tops and passed yet save ourselves there did not seem to be a living soul on maybury hill the majority of the inhabitants had escaped i suppose by way of the old woking road the road i had taken when i drove to leatherhead or they had hidden we went down the lane by the body of the man in black sodden now from the overnight hail and broke into the woods at the foot of the hill we pushed through these towards the railway without meeting a soul. The woods across the line were but the scarred and blackened ruins of woods. For the most part the trees had fallen, but a certain proportion still stood, dismal grey stems with dark brown foliage instead of green. On our side the fire had done no more than scorch the nearer trees. It had failed to secure its footing. In one place the woodman had been at work on Saturday, trees felled and freshly trimmed lay in a clearing with heaps of sawdust by the sawing machine and its engine hard by was a temporary hut deserted there was not a breath of wind this morning and everything was strangely still even the birds were hushed and as we hurried along i and the artilleryman talked in whispers and looked now and again over our shoulders once or twice we stopped to listen after a time we drew near the road, and as we did so we heard the clatter of hooves, and saw through the tree stems three cavalry soldiers riding slowly towards Woking. We hailed them, and they halted while we hurried towards them. It was a lieutenant and a couple of privates of the 8th Hussars, with a stand like a theodolite which the artilleryman told me was a heliograph. "'You are the first men I have seen coming this way this morning,' said the lieutenant. What's brewing? His voice and face were eager. The men behind him stared curiously. The artilleryman jumped down the bank into the road and saluted. Gun destroyed last night, sir. Had been hiding. Trying to rejoin battery, sir. You'll come in sight of the Martians, I expect, about half a mile along this road. 
"'What the dickens are they like?' asked the lieutenant. "'Giants in armour, sir. Hundred feet high, three legs and a body like aluminium, with a mighty great head in a hood, sir.' "'Get out,' said the lieutenant. "'What confounded nonsense!' "'You'll see, sir. They carry a kind of box, sir, that shoots fire and strikes you dead. "'What do you mean, a gun?' "'No, sir.' And the artilleryman began a vivid account of the heat ray. Halfway through, the lieutenant interrupted him and looked up at me. I was still standing on the bank by the side of the road. "'It's perfectly true,' I said. "'Well,' said the lieutenant, "'I suppose it's my business to see to it, too. "'Look here,' to the artilleryman. "'We're detailed here clearing people out of their houses. "'You'd better go along and report yourself to Brigadier General Marvin "'and tell him all you know. "'He's at Weybridge. "'Know the way?' "'I do.' I said, and he turned his horse southward again. Half a mile, you say, said he. At most, I answered, and pointed over the treetop southward. He thanked me and rode on, and we saw them no more. Farther along we came upon a group of three women and two children in the road, busy clearing out a labourer's cottage. They had got hold of a little hand truck and were piling it up with unclean-looking bundles and shabby furniture. They were all too assiduously engaged to talk to us as we passed. By Byfleet Station, we emerged from the pine trees and found the country calm and peaceful under the morning sunlight. We were far beyond the range of the heat ray there, and had it not been for the silent desertion of some of the houses, the stirring movement of packing in others, and the knot of soldiers standing on the bridge over the railway and staring down the line towards Woking, the day would have seemed like any other Sunday. Several farm wagons and carts were moving creakily along the road to Adelston, and suddenly through the gate of a field we saw, across a stretch of flat meadow, six twelve-pounders standing neatly at equal distances pointing towards Woking. The gunners stood by the guns waiting, and the ammunition wagons were at a business-like distance. The men stood almost as if under inspection. "'That's good,' said I. "'They will get one fair shot at any rate.' The artillerymen hesitated at the gate. "'I shall go on,' he said. Farther on towards Weybridge, just over the bridge, there were a number of men in white fatigue jackets throwing up a long rampart and more guns behind. "'It's bows and arrows against the lightning, anyhow,' said the artilleryman. "'They haven't seen that fire beam yet.' The officers, who were not actively engaged, stood and stared over the treetop southwestward, and the men digging would stop every now and again to stare in the same direction. Byfleet was in tumult, people packing and a score of hussars, some of them dismounted, some on horseback, were hunting them about. Three or four black government wagons, with crosses in white circles, and an old omnibus, among other vehicles, were being loaded in the village street. There were scores of people, most of them sufficiently sabbatical to have assumed their best clothes. The soldiers were having the greatest difficulty in making them realise the gravity of their position. We saw one shrivelled old fellow with a huge box and a score or more of flower pots containing orchids, angrily expostulating with the corporal who would leave them behind. I stopped and gripped his arm. Do you know what's over there? I said, pointing at the pine trees that hid the Martians. Eh? said he, turning. I was explaining. This is valuable. "'Death!' I shouted. "'Death is coming! Death!' And leaving him to digest that, if he could, I hurried on after the artilleryman. At the corner I looked back. The soldier had left him, and he was still standing by his box with the pots of orchids on the lid of it, and staring vaguely over the trees. No one in Weybridge could tell us where the headquarters were established. The whole place was in such confusion as I have never seen in any town before. Carts, carriages everywhere, the most astonishing miscellany of conveyances and horseflesh. The respectable inhabitants of the place, men in golf and boating costumes, wives prettily dressed, were packing, riverside loafers energetically helping, children excited, and, for the most part, highly delighted at this astonishing variation of their Sunday experience. In the midst of it all, the worthy vicar was very pluckily holding an early celebration, and his bell was jangling out above the excitement. 
I and the artilleryman seated on the step of the drinking fountain made a very passable meal upon what we had brought with us. Patrols of soldiers, here no longer hussars but grenadiers in white, were warning people to move now or take refuge in their cellars as soon as the firing began. We saw as we crossed the railway bridge that a growing crowd of people had assembled in and about the railway station, and the swarming platform was piled with boxes and packages. The ordinary traffic had been stopped, I believe, in order to allow of the passage of troops and guns to Chertsey, and I have heard since that a savage struggle occurred for places in the special trains that were put on at a later hour. We remained at Weybridge until midday, and at that hour we found ourselves at the place near Shepperton Lock where the Way and the Thames join. Part of the time we spent helping two old women to pack a little cart. The Way has a treble mouth, and at this point boats are to be hired, and there was a ferry across the river. On the Shepperton side was an inn with a lawn, and beyond that the tower of Shepperton Church, it had been replaced by a spire, rose above the trees. Here we found an excited and noisy crowd of fugitives. As yet the flight had not grown to a panic, but there were already far more people than all the boats going to and fro could enable to cross. People came panting along under heavy burdens. One husband and wife were even carrying a small outhouse door between them, with some of their household goods piled thereon. One man told us he meant to try to get away from Shepperton Station. There was a lot of shouting, and one man was even jesting. The idea people seemed to have here was that the Martians were simply formidable human beings, who might attack and sack the town, to be certainly destroyed in the end. Every now and then people would glance nervously across the way, at the meadows towards Chertsey, but everything over there was still. Across the Thames, except just where the boats landed, everything was quiet, in vivid contrast to the Surrey side. The people who landed there from the boats went tramping off down the lane. The big ferry boat had just made a journey. Three or four soldiers stood on the lawn of the inn, staring and jesting at the fugitives, without offering to help. The inn was closed, as it was now within prohibited hours. "'What's that?' cried the boatman, and, "'Shut up, you fool!' said a man near to a yelping dog. Then the sound came again this time from the direction of Chertsey. A muffled thud. The sound of a gun. The fighting was beginning. Almost immediately unseen batteries across the river to our right, unseen because of the trees, took up the chorus, firing heavily one after the other. Everyone stood arrested by the sudden stir of battle, near us and yet invisible to us. Nothing was to be seen save flat meadows, cows feeding unconcernedly for the most part, and silvery pollard willows, motionless in the warm sunlight. "'The soldiers will stop em said a woman beside me, doubtfully. A haziness rose over the treetops. Then suddenly we saw a rush of smoke far away up the river, a puff of smoke that jerked up into the air and hung, and forthwith the ground heaved underfoot and a heavy explosion shook the air, smashing two or three windows in the houses near and leaving us astonished. "'Here they are!' shouted a man in a blue jersey. "'Yonder! Do you see em? Yonder!' Quickly, one after the other, one, two, three, four of the armoured Martians appeared, far away over the little trees across the flat meadows that stretched towards Chertsey, and striding hurriedly towards the river. Little cowled figures they seemed at first, going with a rolling motion as fast as flying birds. Then advancing obliquely towards us came a fifth. Their armoured bodies glittered in the sun as they swept swiftly forward upon the guns, growing rapidly larger as they drew nearer. One on the extreme left, the remotest that is, flourished a huge case high in the air, and the ghostly, terrible heat-ray I had already seen on Friday night smote towards Chertsey and struck the town. At the sight of these strange, swift and terrible creatures, the crowd near the water's edge seemed to me to be for the moment horror-struck. There was no screaming or shouting, but a silence. Then a hoarse murmur and a movement of feet, a splashing from the water. A man, too frightened to drop the portmanteau he carried on his shoulder, swung round and sent me staggering with a blow from the corner of his burden. A woman thrust at me with her hand and rushed past me. I turned with the rush of the people, but I was not too terrified for thought. The terrible heat-ray was in my mind. 
To get under water, that was it. Get under water, I shouted, unheeded. I faced about again and rushed towards the approaching Martians, rushed right down the gravelly beach and headlong into the water. Others did the same. A boatload of people putting back came leaping out as I rushed past. The stones under my feet were muddy and slippery, and the river was so low that I ran perhaps twenty feet scarcely waist deep. Then, as the Martian towered overhead, scarcely a couple of hundred yards away, I flung myself forward under the surface. The splashes of the people in the boats leaping into the river sounded like thunderclaps in my ears. People were landing hastily on both sides of the river, but the Martian machine took no more notice of the moment of the people running this way and that than a man would of the confusion of ants in a nest against which his foot had kicked. When, half suffocated, I raised my head above water, the Martian's hood pointed at the batteries that were still firing across the river, and as it advanced it swung loose what must have been the generator of the heat ray. In another moment it was on the bank, and in a stride wading halfway across. The knees of the foremost leg bent at the farther bank, and in another moment it had raised itself to its full height again, close to the village of Shepperton. Forthwith the six guns, which unknown to anyone on the right bank had been hidden behind the outskirts of the village, fired simultaneously. The sudden near concussion, the last close upon the first, made my heart jump. The monster was already raising the case generating the heat ray as the first shell burst six yards above the hood. I gave a cry of astonishment. I saw and thought nothing of the other four Martian monsters. My attention was riveted on the nearest incident. Simultaneously two other shells burst in the air near the body as the hood twisted round in time to receive, but not in time to dodge, the fourth shell. The shell burst clean in the face of the thing. The hood bulged, flashed, was whirled off in a dozen tattered fragments of red flesh and glittering metal. "'Hit!' shouted I, with something between a scream and a cheer. I heard answering shouts from the people in the water about me. I could have leapt out of the water with that momentary exultation. The decapitated colossus reeled like a drunken giant, but it did not fall over. It recovered its balance by a miracle, and no longer heeding its steps, and with the camera that fired the heat ray now rigidly upheld, it reeled swiftly upon Shepperton. The living intelligence, the Martian within the hood, was slain and splashed to the four winds of heaven, and the thing was now but a mere intricate device of metal whirling to destruction. It drove along in a straight line, incapable of guidance. It struck the tower of Shepperton Church, smashing it down as the impact of a battering ram might have done. Swerved aside, blundered on, and collapsed with tremendous force into the river out of my sight. A violent explosion shook the air, and a spout of water, steam, mud, and shattered metal shot far up into the sky. As the camera of the heat ray hit the water, the latter had immediately flashed into steam. In another moment a huge wave, like a muddy tidal bore, but almost scoldingly hot, came sweeping round the bend upstream. I saw people struggling shorewards, and heard their screaming and shouting faintly above the seething and roar of the Martians' collapse. For a moment I heeded nothing of the heat, forgot the patent need of self-preservation. I splashed through the tumultuous water, pushing aside a man in black to do so, until I could see round the bend. Half a dozen deserted boats pitched aimlessly upon the confusion of the waves. The fallen Martian came into sight downstream, lying across the river and for the most part submerged. Thick clouds of steam were pouring off the wreckage, and through the tumultuously whirling wisps I could see, intermittently and vaguely, the gigantic limbs churning the water and flinging a splash and spray of mud and froth into the air. The tentacles swayed and struck like living arms, and save for the helpless purposeless of these movements, it was as if some wounded thing were struggling for its life amid the waves. Enormous quantities of a ruddy brown fluid were spurting up in noisy jets out of the machine. My attention was diverted from this death flurry by a furious yelling, like that of the thing called a siren in our manufacturing towns. A man, knee-deep near the towing path, was shouting inaudibly to me and pointed. Looking back, I saw the other Martians advancing with gigantic strides down the riverbank from the direction of Chertsey, the Shepperton guns spoke this time unavailingly. 
At that I ducked at once under the water, and holding my breath until movement was an agony, blundered painfully ahead under the surface as long as I could. The water was a tumult about me, and rapidly growing hotter. When for a moment I raised my head to take breath and throw the hair and water from my eyes, the steam was rising in a whirling white fog that at first hit the Martians altogether. The noise was deafening. Then I saw them dimly, colossal figures of grey, magnified by the mist. They had passed by me, and two were stooping over the throffing, tumultuous ruins of their comrade. The third and fourth stood beside him in the water, one perhaps two hundred yards from me, and the other towards Laleham. The generators of the heat rays waved high, and the hissing beams smote down this way and that. The air was full of sound, a deafening and confusing conflict of noises, the clangorous din of the Martians, the crash of falling houses, the thud of trees, fences, sheds flashing into flame, and the crackling and roaring of fire. Dense black smoke was leaping up to mingle with the steam from the river, and as the heat ray went to and fro over Weybridge, its impact was marked by flashes of incandescent white that gave place at once to a smoky dance of lurid flames. The nearer houses stood still intact, awaiting their fate, shadowy, faint, and pallid in the steam, with the fire behind them going to and fro. For a moment, perhaps, I stood there, breast high in the almost boiling water, dumbfounded at my position, hopeless of escape. Through the reek I could see the people who had been with me in the river scrambling out of the water through the reeds, like little frogs hurrying through the grass from the advance of a man, or running to and fro in utter dismay on the towpath. Then suddenly the white flashes of the heat ray came leaping towards me, the houses caved in as they dissolved at its touch and darted out flames. The trees changed to fire with a roar. The ray flickered up and down the towing path, licking off the people who ran this way and that, and came down to the water's edge not fifty yards from where I stood. It swept across the river to Shepperton, and the water in its track rose in a boiling wheel, crested with steam. I turned shoreward. In another moment the huge wave, well nigh at the boiling point, had rushed upon me. I screamed aloud and scolded, half-blinded, agonised, I staggered through the leaping, hissing water towards the shore. Had my foot stumbled it would have been the end. I fell helplessly, in full sight of the Martians, upon the broad, bare, gravelly spit that runs down to mark the angle of the way and the Thames. I expected nothing but death. I have a dim memory of the foot of a Martian coming down with a score of yards of my head, driving straight into the loose gravel, whirling it this way and that, and lifting again. Of a long suspense, and then of the four carrying the debris of their comrade between them, now clear and then presently faint through the veil of smoke, receding interminably, as it seemed to me, across a vast space of river and meadow, and then, very slowly, I realised that by a miracle I had escaped. End of chapter 12 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. War of the Worlds by H. G. Wells Book One Chapter Thirteen How I Fell In With the Curate After getting this sudden lesson in the power of terrestrial weapons, the Martians retreated to their original position on Horsell Common, and in their haste, and encumbered with the debris of their smashed companion, they no doubt overlooked many such a stray and negligible victim as myself. Had they left their comrade and pushed on forthwith, there was nothing at that time between them and London but batteries of twelve-pounder guns, and they would certainly have reached the capital in advance of the tidings of their approach, as sudden, dreadful, and destructive their advent would have been as the earthquake that destroyed Lisbon a century ago. But they were in no hurry. Cylinder followed cylinder on its interplanetary flight, Every twenty-four hours brought them reinforcement. And meanwhile, the military and naval authorities, 
now fully alive to the tremendous power of their antagonists, worked with furious energy. Every minute a fresh gun came into position until before twilight every copse, every row of suburban villas on the hilly slopes about Kingston and Richmond masked an expectant black muzzle. And through the charred and desolate area, perhaps twenty square miles altogether, that encircled the Martian encampment on Horse or Common, through charred and ruined villages among the green trees, through the blackened and smoking arcades that had been but a day ago pine spinneys, crawled the devoted scouts with the heliographs that were presently to warn the gunners of the Martian approach. But the Martians now understood our command of artillery and the danger of human proximity, and not a man ventured within a mile of either cylinder, save at the price of his life. It would seem that these giants spent the earlier part of the afternoon in going to and fro, transferring everything from the second and third cylinders, the second in Addiston Golf Links and the third at Pyreford, to their original pit on Horse or Common. Over that, above the blackened heather and ruined buildings that stretch far and wide, stood one as sentinel, while the rest abandoned their vast fighting machines and descended into the pit. They were, they were hard at work. They were hard at work there, far into the night, and the towering pillar of dense green smoke that rose therefrom could be seen from the hills about Merrow, and even, it is said, from Banstead and Epsom Downs. And while the Martians behind me were thus preparing for their next sally, and in front of me humanity gathered for the battle. I made my way with infinite pains and labour from the fire and smoke of burning Weybridge towards London. I saw an abandoned boat, very small and remote, drifting downstream, and throwing off the most of my sodden clothes, I went after it and gained it, and so escaped out of that destruction. There were no oars in the boat, but I contrived to paddle, as well as my parboard hands would allow, down the river towards Halliford and Walton going very tediously and continually looking behind me, as you may well understand. I followed the river because I considered that the water gave me the best chance of escape should these giants return. The hot water from the Martians' overthrow drifted downstream with me, so that for the best part of a mile I could see little of either bank. Once, however, I made out a string of black figures hurrying across the meadows from the direction of Weybridge. Halliford, it seems, was deserted, and several of the houses facing the river were on fire. It was strange to see the place quite tranquil, quite desolate under the hot blue sky, with the smoke and little threads of flame going straight up into the heat of the afternoon. Never before had I seen houses burning without the accompaniment of an obstructive crowd. A little farther on, the dry reeds up the bank were smoking and glowing, and a line of fire inland was marching steadily across a late field of hay. For a long time I drifted, so painful and weary was I after the violence I had been through, and so intense the heat upon the water. Then my fears got the better of me again, and I resumed my paddling. The sun scorched my bare back. At last, as the bridge at Walton was coming into sight round the bend, my fever and faintness overcame my fears, and I landed on the Middlesex bank and lay down, deadly sick, among the long grass. I suppose the time was then about four or five o'clock. I got up presently, walked perhaps half a mile without meeting a soul, and then lay down again in the shadow of a hedge. I seemed to remember talking wanderingly to myself during that last spurt. I was also very thirsty and bitterly regretted I had drunk no more water. It is a curious thing that I felt angry with my wife. I cannot account for it, but my impotent desire to reach Leatherhead worried me excessively. I do not clearly remember the arrival of the curate, so that probably I dozed. I became aware of him as a seated figure in a soot-smudged shirt-sleeves and with his upturned, clean-shaven face staring at a faint flickering that danced over the sky. The sky was what is called a mackerel sky, rows and rows of faint down plumes of cloud 
just tinted with the midsummer sunset. I sat up, and at the rustle of my motion, he looked at me quickly. "'Have you any water?' I asked abruptly. He shook his head. "'You have been asking for water for the last hour,' he said. For a moment we were silent, taking stock of each other. I dare say he found me a strange enough figure, naked, save for my water-soaked trousers and socks, scolded, and my face and shoulders blackened by the smoke. His face was a fair weakness, his chin retreated, and his hair lay in crisp, almost flaxen curls on his low forehead. His eyes were rather large, pale blue, and blankly staring. He spoke abruptly, looking vacantly away from me. "'What does this mean?' he said. "'What do these things mean?' I stared at him and made no answer. He extended a thin white hand and spoke in almost a complaining tone. "'Why are these things permitted? What sins have we done? The morning service was over. I was walking through the roads to clear my brain for the afternoon, and then fire, earthquake, death. As if it were Sodom and Gomorrah, all our work all done, all the work. What are these Martians?' "'What are we?' I answered, clearing my throat. He gripped his knees and turned to look at me again. For half a minute, perhaps, he stared silently. "'I was walking through the roads to clear my brain,' he said, "'and suddenly, fire, earthquake, death!' He relapsed into silence, with his chin now sunken almost to his knees. Presently he began waving his hand. All the work, all the Sunday schools, what have we done? What has Weybridge done? Everything gone, everything destroyed. The church, we rebuilt it only three years ago, gone, swept out of existence. Why? Another pause, and he broke out again like one demented. The smoke of her burning goeth up for ever and ever, he shouted. His eyes flamed, and he pointed a lean finger in the direction of Weybridge. By this time I was beginning to take his measure. The tremendous tragedy in which he had been involved, it was evident he was a fugitive from Weybridge, had driven him to the very verge of his reason. "'Are we far from Sunbury?' I said in a matter-of-fact tone. "'What are we to do?' he asked. Are these creatures everywhere? Has the earth been given over to them? Are we far from Sunbury? Only this morning I officiated at early celebration. Things have changed, I said quietly. You must keep your head. There is still hope. Hope? Yes, plentiful hope for all this destruction. I began to explain my view of our position. He listened at first, but as I went on the interest dawning in his eyes gave place to their former stare, and his regard wandered from me. "'This must be the beginning of the end,' he said, interrupting me. "'The end! The great and terrible day of the Lord, when men shall hide upon the mountains, and the rocks fall upon them and hide them, hide them from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne!' I began to understand the position. I ceased my laboured reasoning, struggled to my feet, and standing over him, laid my hand on his shoulders. "'Be a man,' I said. "'You are scared out of your wits. What good is religion if it collapses under calamity? Think of what earthquakes and floods, wars and volcanoes have done before to men. Did you think God had exempted Weybridge? He is not an insurance agent.' For a time he sat in blank silence. "'But how can we escape?' he asked suddenly. They are invulnerable. They are pitiless. Neither the one nor perhaps the other, I answered. And the mighty they are, the more sane and wary should we be. One of them was killed yonder not three hours ago. Killed? he said, staring about him. How can God's ministers be killed? I saw it happen, I proceeded to tell him. We have chanced to come in for the thick of it, said I, and that is all. "'What is that flicker in the sky?' he asked abruptly. 
I told him it was the heliograph signalling, that it was the sign of human help and effort in the sky. We are in the midst of it, I said. Quiet as it is, that flicker in the sky tells of the gathering storm. Yonder, I take it, are the Martians, and Londonwood, where those hills rise about Richmond and Kingston, and the trees give cover, earthworks are being thrown up and guns are being placed. Presently the Martians will be coming this way again. And even as I spoke, he sprang to his feet and stopped me by a gesture. Listen, he said. From beyond the low hills across the water came the dull resonance of distant guns and a remote weird crying. Then everything was still. A cockchafer came droning over the hedge and past us. High in the west, the crescent moon hung faint and pale above the smoke of Weybridge and Shepperton and the hot, still splendour of the sunset. We had better follow this path, I said, northward. End of chapter 13